I've been in the process of reviewing a lot of bad games as of late, particularly this one, so as to not break into the tedium for just a little bit, let's quickly review Sega Genesis game that I really freaking like. Twinkle Tail, or Twinkle Toes as I like to call it, although either name is equally stupid, was developed by Zap Entertainment, famous for developing such classics as Bomber King for the MSX, and published by Toyo Records, famous for publishing such classics like Twinkle Tail in 1992. The game is but a single example of a Sega Genesis game that was released exclusively in Japan from a beyond obscure third party developer and a beyond obscure third party publisher. A vast majority of these types of games were shoot 'em ups in absolute Genesis, or in this case Mega Drive, delicacy. A vast majority of these types of games were also released in extremely limited quantities. I know I talk about rarity in video games a lot on this channel, that's not by coincidence either, it's just what I take an interest in. But in Twinkle Tail's case, it's kind of obligatory that I bring this up. Why? Because if you're interested in playing this game, then be prepared to pony up about $400. More along the lines of $150 if you manage to find a loose cart, but for whatever reason, loose copies of the game pop up on eBay a lot less frequently than complete ones. So, good luck with that. To give you an idea of just how rare this game actually is, it interests you to know that I captured the footage for this review via a reproduction cartridge. And I own a genuine copy of Color a Dinosaur on the NES. I generally don't like to talk about games like this. Super high quality and super low quantities and all that jazz, lest the little Samson effect occurs. I think there was also a little Samson once upon a time that was five bucks. And someone was selling it on eBay for like... 500. Little Samson. Only $585. But at this tier of rarity, screw it. If you're willing to spend 400 bucks on a 20 year old video game, then chances are you're willing to spend 4 to more if the price inflates. The best way to describe Twinkle Tail is that it's the Mega Drive's answer to Pocky and Rocky. Or rather, Pocky and Rocky's the SNES's answer to Twinkle Tail. Because this game was developed first, believe it or not. Provided the two games came out like four months apart from each other, so there's no way not to be plagiarized, but it is fairly ironic that Pocky and Rocky ended up being the game that people remembered. Oh, the power of localization. I don't really have any way of comparing the two scenes, so I don't own either of the Pocky and Rocky games, nor do I ever really intend to. But for all intents and purposes, let's just say that I probably still have my preferences set on this game. You know, blast processing and all. For those of you that haven't played either, let's just say that they're both part of an extremely niche subgenre. That subgenre being shoot 'em up games that don't auto scroll, take place on foot, and allow you to shoot in all right directions. I have no idea if there was ever an official name given to this type of game, but it's a subgenre that's all but dead now, so I doubt we'll ever get one if not. Though, with Wild Guns Reloaded being a thing, I guess anything's possible. The game actually has a decently robust combat system for an action based Mega Drive game. At any point, you're allowed to switch between three different weapons, which are straight from the game's poorly translated opening cutscene, by the way the Shooting Star, the Diamond Arrow, and the Silver Comet. All of which are allowed to temporarily upgrade a total of twice. Level 1 almost always being completely useless, level 2 being a fair enough cover ride, and level 3 being hashtag 3OP5Me. You're allowed to upgrade these through means of picking up these star icons which are hidden away in treasure chests. These treasure chests can also potentially contain health power-ups which are self-explanatory, and magic spells which I'm gonna take a quick detour to explain just for the sake of completeness. You have two magic spells in the game, the balls and the pizzas. I wouldn't tell you their actual official names, but assuming it's hidden somewhere deep in the instruction manual, A, I don't speak Japanese, and B, I don't own a several hundred dollar instructional booklet. The ball is significantly more powerful than the pizza, but it takes a minute to charge up and can miss your target entirely. The pizza is guaranteed for everything on screen, but for a shorter period of time and for less damage. You're allowed to hold up to three of these spells at a time. And from there, if you pick up another one, it just cycles through one of your others. All in all, it's a pretty interesting, if incredibly situational, extension to your choices in combat. But anyways, back to the default weapons. I, I didn't really structure this script very well. The Shooting Star is your default weapon, and it kind of sucks. Upgrading this weapon to level 3 is how it gets pretty much any of its usage, because at that point it rains down at about a third of the screen. But aside from that, it's very archaic come some of the later levels. It's worth noting though that he used it like twice in level 8, so there's that. The Diamond Arrow is a lot of the same, except it's significantly more powerful and can pretty much tear through every boss in the entire game. Sure, you're expending a lot of range when you use it, but it is a sacrifice well worth the benefit. Even with that said though, the Silver Common is probably the weapon you're going to be using the most. As far as I know, it's about on the same power level as a Shooting Star, but here's the thing, instead of being a massive spread shot that can easily miss enemies, it homes in on everything. With this weapon at level 3, you pretty much win 70% of the game. Because it should go without saying that homing plus enemies that come in on all eight directions equals you holding the shoot button and waltzing through the entire game. This is where the game obviously becomes a little unbalanced, but to me this weapon is of the same kit as things like Metal Man's weapon in Mega Man 2. It's so broken that it makes the game a thousand times better. 
With that said though, this game is by no means easy. Twinkle Tail can be played on four different difficulty settings, easy, normal, hard, and super hard, all of which are pretty dang self-explanatory. Each difficulty setting predominantly changes one thing and one thing only, that being your enemy's HP. While that doesn't sound like a lot, with this in effect, the bosses go from being relatively easy and harmless to complete and total rounds of endurance, nothing more, and nothing less. And it's pretty zang annoying come hard and super hard mode. And the checkpoints are pretty stingy in this game regardless. So it's not uncommon for you to get to a boss on low health, get the crap kicked out of you, and have to deal with level 1 weapons the next time you fight them. Oh yeah, that's another thing. Minus things like falling off of a cliff, whenever you take damage in this game, you lose one level of whatever weapon you were currently holding. On one hand, I love this mechanic. It makes things like weapon conservation pretty prevalent to the game, and practically forces you to switch weapons regularly on the higher difficulty settings. With easy mode though, the whole hold B and walk forward strat works pretty reliably though. On the other hand, I hate this mechanic. Please refer back to 30 seconds ago to get your answer as to why that is. It even gets to the point where death abuse is a pretty common practice because levels carry over from life to life. Though, to be fair, that problem can be rectified by a lot of practice courtesy of the stage selects, but even then, some bosses remain a complete crapshoot. Take the stage 7 boss, for example, one of the most sadistic things I have ever seen in any video game in history. The stage itself is the only traditional auto-scroller in the entire game, and it features zero checkpoints, minimal health upgrades, a billion bolts on the screen at the same time, and a mini-boss that is explicitly designed to take as long as possible to kill. Let's just assume you get to this part with full health and level 3 everything. Basically, every attack that the boss dishes out is practically freaking undodgeable. So you have to liberally scroll between your weapons just to lose a level on whatever weapon you find to be least valuable when the boss attacks. And just when you think you've beaten it, it's got a second form with even more stupid, near undodgeable attacks. Honestly, I don't know why they didn't just make this the final boss of the game. The actual final boss is pretty underwhelming, all things considered. Regardless, the moral of the story here is screw this boss, and while you're at it, screw the rest of the entire level because it pops up way too freaking early. One last thing I want to note about the difficulty of this game, and this is probably its biggest downfall by the way, is the post tenant vulnerability. Or lack thereof. Well, okay, it's not totally absent from the game, but what it is, is super, super brief. As such, in specific parts of this game, all it takes is a bad position to leave your health bar in ruins. Thankfully, if you take the game methodically and don't play on super hard ever, it's pretty easy to circumvent this. Seriously, don't ever, ever play on super hard. So now that I've done my fair share of harping on this game, it's time to gush. The music in this game is really good. Chances are, even if you're not a fan of the Mega Drive's twang, you'll still likely walk away with songs that you at least liked. I mean, there's about 30 of them for crying out loud. It's not Herzog's Vi or Time Track's levels of good, but it is definitely better than 90% of the Mega Drive's crappy songs here in North America. I fully admit to thinking that the Mega Drive is way better than the SNES, but even I can admit that. The graphics are a lot of the same. Pretty good, just short of being great. The whole game has a nice cartoony aesthetic to it, and 90% of the sprite work is pretty fantastic. Some great examples being pretty much any of the bosses. Serena herself looks pretty good, guess that's the actual name of the protagonist by the way, and there's a pretty impressive variety of enemies in the game as well. With that said, the settings of the stages can occasionally look uninspired. Most of the time they actually look pretty nice, but stages 2 and 6 in particular look pretty bland to look at. Yes, I realize that was an incredibly redundant sentence, but I can't re-record it, so you're gonna have to live with it. This hurts me just as much as it hurts you. Probably. Yeah, this is reaching pretty far for things to critique, but then again, the Mega Drive has some really stiff competition in this regard. Still though, it is decently up with some of the better looking games on the system. So with all that said, there really remains only one question left unanswered. Is the game worthy of a 6 out of 6? By the way, if you're new, I have no idea why I rate games like that. Well, that's tough to say. I mean, from an objective standpoint, the game is a 5 out of 6, no question. I may be an unapologetic fanboy of the game, but even I'm willing to admit that the game has its fair share of flaws. Unlike some people. Subjectively, however, I think that Twinkle Tail represents just about everything that I adore about video games. The game came from an obscure third-party developer and an even more obscure third-party publisher. It was also the last game that either company actually worked on. And given the extremely limited print of the game, I would gander less than 30,000 copies to be generous, monetary gain was obviously not the number one priority. Even crap like Divine Stealing deserves some respect in that regard. This game had no expectations to live up to, and yet it exceeded on almost every front. And in a world where big name publishers like EA and Ubisoft constantly put out disappointing game after disappointing game, games like this come along to prove to the world that genuine good intent and talent still exists 
somewhere. When it's all said and done, however, this dreadfully unfortunate example of that got played by 25 people somewhere in the depths of Japan, and chances are it will never be re-released. So to that oh-so-subjective and opinionated end, this game deserves it. Would recommend, provided you're a billionaire.